Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Today we have episode 304. We have Louis Martin from High Percentage Martial Arts. Uh, we had an article a week or two ago where, you know, we talked about uh, uh, the data analytics on 100 plus white belt matches, and uh, that was from Louis Martin from uh, High Percentage Martial Arts. We uh, thoroughly enjoyed that article, so we thought we'd invite him on and uh, talk to him. So uh, stay tuned. You do not want to miss that part. But as always, I have my partners in crime, Heckle and Jekyll, uh, Byron and Joe. How are you two, do- two guys <laughs> doing today? Is it, am I Heckle? Is it my turn to heckle you throughout the whole uh, show, Gary? I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'm doing well- good. Yeah, normally Byron's the guy who heckles me. So, uh, Joe, I think it'll be uh, be good if you heckle me today, and and Byron can just sit in the corner and jekyll with himself. <laughs> okay, I, 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 you know, I, I I don't even know what this heckling. I'm thinking uh, that. Uh, Dr. Google Jekyll, right Mr. Now. Hyde, no. <laughs> but that's not no. the right thing. Joe, but Joe, happy you know to be here, guys. Jekyll. I think Heckle and Jekyll's, uh, isn't that a cartoon that older yeah. people would be familiar with? Oh, now we got to throw in the age again. <laughs> so, so, consequently, Gary is the only member of this team that has any idea what Heckle and Jekyll is. <laughs> but uh, It's two crows, it appears. Magpies. Magpies, okay. It looks like a crow. That was my what's, the difference between a crow, what's the difference between a crow and a magpie, Gary? They're spelled differently. A crow starts with a C, and a magpie has a little more letters and starts with an M. That's why we keep you around. Yep. A lot Thank of you. particle particles in you that w- head And you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to eat a crow for dessert. But a magpie right, a sounds pie, like a That's type, all right. Yeah, it sounds like a type of a dessert. Yeah, a crow pie. <laughs> okay. You might eat crow, but that's not that's nothing that you would uh, – that's not what you want to do. But uh, if you are in your first year of jiu-jitsu, I have some an idea what you might want to do. <laughs> uh, check out your uh, this audiobook, your first year of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, it's much like a podcast. It's, it's just audio content. It's about two and a half hours long, and it features me uh, just kind of walking you through your first year of grappling. And whether you're already in that first year or you're thinking about hitting the mats, I, I want to help you avoid some pitfalls and, and to smooth over some of the hurdles or knock over some of the hurdles or jump the hurdles, however we want to get past those. But I wanted you to get through that first year because the first year is tough. It's just, just a kind of a collection of ideas I have for you. And I think it really benefits anybody who's kind of in this beginning stage of, of uh, jujitsu. It's 1199. The money goes, it helps support the podcast. Uh, there's a link to it in the show notes. And I'd be uh, honored to help you start off your Brazilian jiu-jitsu journey. You know, like you said, Byron, uh, you know, that first year is tough and, and that's what you're, you know, trying to get them through. You know, it's it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. And that kind of reminds me of a Chinese proverb. Uh, uh, if your mind is strong, all difficult things will become easy. If your mind is weak, all easy things will become difficult. Joe, what do you think about that proverb and how it relates to jujitsu? Well, jujitsu definitely is a difficult thing. And, uh, I do think most people sort of confuse the two. They, they worry about how difficult it is physically, but man, it's uh, once you get your mind right, uh, get committed to it, it becomes a lot easier. I like this. I heard recently that um, people talk about overtraining, but most of us don't actually have a strong enough mind to act, ever get in the physical condition of being overtrained. We talk about, oh, I'm overtrained, I'm exhausted, and really our bodies could go further but it's our our minds that don't let us go further. So, if you have to strengthen, if you have the decision to strengthen your mind or strengthen your body, strengthen the mind first, and the body will follow. Joe, I really like that. I, I never uh, uh, really thought about that much, but be it the overtraining part, where you know, you most of us don't have a strong enough mind to really overtrain, and and never really thought about that. But as you were talking about it. It, you really have to have a mind to, to really push yourself to that level. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever listened to David Goggins, 
Um, but he's sure. a guy I kind of listen to a lot there. And, uh, you know, he talks about embrace the suck. Um, you know, what, what he can do with his mind that, you know, other people can't. You know, he can push his body, you know, way, way past, uh, you know, other people. But, uh, you know, I like that if your mind is strong, all difficult things will become easy. And, uh, you know, having that strong mind, as Joe says, first, um, you know, is really going to help you. It's going to make things much easier. So I look at this a little bit differently. Um, it, it, if your mind is weak, easy things become uh, difficult. And, you know, if your mind is strong, hard, you know, difficult things become easy. Just I look at it as, as change your mindset a little bit about anything that's challenging you. And, and jiu-jitsu is a great example for this. If, if you go into jiu-jitsu and, you know, you're fairly new and you're like, I got to somehow figure out how to tab out these blue belts and you're trying to tap them out is really hard and you gotta you need that yeah sure you could need that like strong mindset and eventually you'll get there and you'll you know you'll get to that blue belt level or you know start approaching that or you could go to jiu-jitsu and just kind of enjoy the process and just enjoy the actual act of learning and getting better at jiu-jitsu and it, it, it won't be a difficult thing like a frustration thing. It, you're just going to be hard no matter what you do. But if you can take out the frustration, it'll be, it won't be easy. It'll seem easy because it's enjoyable. When you could enjoy something that's difficult because it's difficult, I think that that's kind of a, uh, a similar thing to this, this uh, Chinese proverb, but it's a little bit different mindset. Um, kind of enjoy it. And that's like with David Goggins, you know, like em- embrace the sucky things and, and stick them head on. I, that's a hard, to me, That to me, that's a hard long-term strategy to get up every day and do something that you think sucks. Um, that, that's kind of, he could do it. He's, he's a unique uh, uh, person with, with that. But to me, I want to get up every morning and do something that I enjoy. And, and I'm just fortunate that jujitsu is something that has been healthy for me and, uh, and, and I'm able to enjoy it as well. Byron, on the embrace the suck part, the way I look at it, and it's something that, you know, I've tried to do, you know, I tell myself, hey, I got to embrace the suck. Um, yeah, I definitely want to do stuff that I like to do, jujitsu or whatever. But, you know, some days, let's say I can't train jujitsu and, and I still need to work out. And, uh, you know, let's say I want to go for a run and it's raining out or, you know, I want to go ride my mountain bike and that wind's blowing like 100 miles an hour and I, it's going to suck. But what I try to tell myself is kind of like what Joe was talking about that, you know, you can't push yourself beyond that limit, you know, without a strong mind. So, you know, there are times where, you know, if the weather was bad or if I was feeling down, I wouldn't want to go really push myself. And, and what, you know, I tell myself embrace the suck, which is pushing myself, which then will make me better at jujitsu. And it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's just, I need a, well, I guess I don't necessarily really enjoy pushing myself that hard, but, uh, you know, it's going to pay dividends in the long run to make my jujitsu better, make my overall health better, stuff like that. Yeah. That makes sense. I like that, Gary. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely want to, I don't want to, you know, wake up every morning and just do stuff I hate and, uh, you know, not, uh, not enjoy my life. <laughs> but sometimes, I mean, life throws curveballs and things that are kind of rough and you could like bring that, uh, to your life with a good attitude and conquer that, or you can kind of just, you know, pity and, and man, things, things are tough for me right, right now. Yeah. And I mean, to be honest, that brings me to a life lesson. Um, you know, it's one thing that, uh, Joe and I have kind of both been through this. Um, well, Joe much worse than me, but, um, uh, you know, my, uh, we've had a lot of rain here in, uh, Wichita here and, uh, my house flooded, my basement flooded really bad. My, uh, backyard became a, you know, a lake, my, my house was underwater. Uh, my fence is gone. My roof got destroyed. My siding got destroyed. Um, you name it. Um, you know, and Joe had been through that with a hurricane. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, it's never fun. It's when it's happening, you're, you're just like, man, there's nothing I can do. You're, you know, the water's just coming in and, you know, there's nothing you can do. It's just coming so fast that you can't get it out. And, um, you know, we can, like as Byron said, we can just, you know, fold over and, uh, you know, just think about the negative parts and, you know, oh boy, this is terrible. And, you know, it, it's not a fun situation to be in. I guess we're embracing the suck, but, or we can, you know, 
do do what we can do look at the bright side and uh you know realize we have insurance realize we have friends i mean how many times have i talked about uh joe's buddy um that you know helped him you know fix his house get his house back up and uh you know we have a lot of good friends i mean i know yesterday never even talked to byron about what has happened to my house and uh byron's like hey i'll be over at three o'clock um you know i had so many friends you know just reach out that i had never even talked to um told them about it say hey i can come over and help and uh you know i had everything taken care of i didn't need help but uh you know how can you be down when you have you know people helping out and uh you know life's gonna go on it's let's just keep plugging ahead let's let's have fun i mean byron asked me if i showed up to jujitsu last night uh, or yesterday morning you know i was up till four o'clock in the morning you know tearing carpet out and stuff like that and uh um you know i told byron hey i didn't miss jujitsu jujitsu is the fun part of my day it's uh I'm going to take a break, have some fun, and, uh, you know, I'll get back to work a little bit later. But uh, I also look at it that I'm learning new skills that I didn't have before. I meet new friends. You know, I met a bunch of neighbors that I didn't know before that, you know, are all in kind of uh, uh, crappy positions. And, uh, you know, I think this goes along with the chat, the proverb, you know, my, my mind is strong. Uh, you know, I'm going to think about the positives. And, uh, you know, it goes back to jujitsu jitsu too. Um, we're going to have a lot of bad days. Uh, you know, I look at a flood as when uh you know we're 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 in one of the valleys we're not in one of the peaks you know i'm i'm not having the greatest time on the mat uh, my 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 game isn't as sharp as normal but you know it's all gonna pass you know you know every storm is gonna pass and uh and uh tarn i'm trying to think of that country song by jason aldean every every storm i can't think of it but uh Uh, you know it's going to pass and uh, you know we're going to get to the good times you know we just need to keep plugging away we need to have a strong mind and uh, you know pretty soon this will become easy but you know we're going to have peaks and valleys on the mat we're going to have peaks and valleys in life and uh, you know the key is you know have a good attitude and and keep plugging away and everything will fall in place yeah we were talking about this before we started recording and uh, really just amazed by (laughs) Gary's basement flooded and he's got such a great attitude about it and just say hey you know it's something we gotta get past and and uh it's, it's not a big deal it's, this isn't uh and and you know it's a great attitude i don't know if i'd have the same attitude if my basement had a bunch of water in it but in reality you know your family's healthy <laughs> like you know that's a really big deal you, i mean your, your job is stable you have like a lot of things are really going great for you and yeah your basement's flooded that really sucks. I got sucks. a pool now, Byron. You got a pool. Never had got lake, an indoor lakeside pool property now, temporary. Yeah. Yep. But uh, just impressed with that that you're able to kind of kind of conquer this and and not have it you know ruin your your day, your week, or your month, or or anything like that. Um, man, look up to you for that, man. I don't know if I would be in the same positive attitude. <laughs> so well, how much good- uh, how much water did you have in your basement, Gary? Uh, seven or eight drops, Joe. <laughs> I was going to say, since your gym was down there, you guys should have just rolled right through it and just, uh, <laughs> you know, a little, little underwater grappling there. Yeah. Now, I, I'm really impressed with the way you're handling this, Gary. And, and one thing that jumps out at me is you're talking about all these people coming out of the woodwork to help you. And, you know, sometimes you can write that off to just being fortunate or being surrounded by good neighbors. But there's also something else that is revealed there. And that's that, uh, you, you are the type of person that will do anything for anybody else. And I'm going to wager that the people that are coming out of the woodwork to help you at some point in the last five, 10, 15 years, you've done things to help them too. And we don't be nice to people expecting a payback at some point, but it is sort of like a, an account you have with people, right? And you do things nice for them. And it's like, you're putting something in the account. And then when you need to make a withdrawal, you've got a positive balance there. And so it's awesome to see that coming to fruition for you. Yeah, just uh, you know, I'm blessed. I've I've met a lot of good people, and uh, you know, I, I I don't know why anybody likes me. Um, you know, I'm just. Uh, well, just we can't a... we can't figure it out. Either, Gary. <laughs> 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 How you managed to get somebody to marry you, uh, Gary? I'm impressed. Well, you know, there is such a thing called a mail order bride, Byron. You yeah, know, you just got to save up a little bit of money. <laughs> you got a mail. Order <laughs> well, that backfired on me. <laughs> How about a... I thought uh, Joe was supposed to be doing the heckling, and you were going <laughs> to sit in the corner and juggle yourself. Oh, uh, man. 
we we tagged there, so it's. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's tag out of this, and we'll bring on uh, Lewis Martin. This is going to be great, guys. Uh, if you are a competitor early on, white belt, blue belt, he's really breaking down these matches and figuring out what's happening in them. Um, at least you might be able to change some of your game plan a little bit to help know, know what to expect or, or maybe see some indications of what's important in a match. If you're a coach and you're coaching white belts and blue belts, and really anybody could be put in that spot, you know, purple belts, even other blue belts and white belts could sometimes coach each other at a busy tournament where, you know, or maybe you travel with a buddy and you end up having to help them out. Great information for everybody. So uh, here is Lewis Martin from High Percentage Martial Arts. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He does the barambolo while passing your guard. He is known for a lightning fast gi choke that he only does in no gi. His triangle choke has four sides. One of his cauliflower ears was eaten by a vegetarian. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Stay sweaty, my friend. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Louis Martin to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Louis, we've got a ton of stuff to talk about. You have one of the uh, coolest jujitsu uh, websites, High Percentage Martial Arts, and uh, kind of we, we stumbled upon that on the on the show a little while ago, and I really fell in love with it and what you're doing there. But uh, before we get too deep into that, Louis, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us who you are and uh, what you're up to. Hey, Byron. Thanks. Uh, I just want to say I've been listening to BJJ Brick kind of off and on for years. I think it's a great podcast and and it's a really good compliment to, I guess, what I'm doing with uh, High Percentage Martial Arts. All right. Well, th- well thank you. And it's, it's, a, it's great to have you on the show. So um, I am uh, just a guy from uh, from California. I've been training for about eight years. You might, I think this might be my ninth year. Um, and I'm blessed because I've had a jiu-jitsu journey where I've, I've been to a lot of different schools and, and a lot of different schools of thought. So I started doing like the super conservative old school Gracie jiu-jitsu, all self-defense. I used to be super anti-competition and, you know, I, I only use like the clothes guard and overhooks and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, circumstances change. I ended up at like a pretty modern tournament school, uh, even though we were still kind of doing like fundamental Elio Gracie jiu-jitsu stuff but then I started competing and um you know I, I really enjoyed that and and I really enjoyed that kind of fast-paced tournament style and then I ended up at 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu in Ventura which is a great school they're kind of a newer younger school if anyone wants is interested in that and lives in Southern California and then that like completed the journey to the dark side where like I started off doing you know, like the real fundamentals. And then by the end of it, I was, you know, I was truck rolling and landing in the honey hole and really enjoying sort of the, uh, the progressive stuff. And now I'm in Sacramento. I'm training at Elliot Kelly's school, uh, El Dorado Hills Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And they're perfect because they're like a perfect blend of everything. They do gi, no gi, tournament, casual. And I love them because no one there is obsessed with like the, the right way to do Jiu Jitsu. Like they're very open minded. So it's a good fit for me. All right. I mean, that's I think that's pretty uh, kind of common to to start martial arts for one reason and and then have that reason change, and that and that's perfectly okay. I don't think many people start jujitsu thinking I want to compete in jujitsu. Usually, something else is appealing to that because uh, we're really not exposed to competition jujitsu right at the beginning. Uh, before we even walk in the door, you might come in to learn some self defense, and you might stay, you know, because you, you know, that's where your friends are, or because you like to compete, or there's been different reasons. And to be able to kind of adapt and, and to roll with those uh, changes, that's an important part of, of being able to stay on the mats for as many years as you have. Yeah, I think if you're like, if you're pretty stubborn and you have a really specific idea of like what you think jujitsu is. Um, I think jujitsu is way harder when you have that mentality because you're constantly in this defensive mode where you're justifying why you do certain things and, and, you know, something, a guy comes in and he's doing a a really modern position, like, like inverting guard or the lapel guard. And you, you have to be like, ah, that's not jujitsu, you know? Uh, so if you're open-minded jujitsu, I think is easier. You're going to learn faster, um, than if, you know, you just, um, are, you know, jiu-jitsu is only jiu-jitsu when it's your way kind of thing. 
So do you tell me? Do you train uh, gi, no gi? Is there do you lean one way more than the other? Yeah. So I used to be a total gi guy, um, and then I went to Tenth Planet, and um, I loved it there. I loved the Tenth Planet system. I, I loved like their kind of really informal um, culture. Scott Ross and Matt Dempsey down in Ventura are really great teachers. And what I learned is it's really hard for me to go back to the gi because. You know, in the gi, like I feel like I have a really good command of of the field, but um, but when I get a gi and these guys get grips on me and stuff, like that's that's a weird thing to go back to. So I'm I'm kind of sixty percent no gi at this point. Yeah, and just kind of, <laughs> I always find it, it kind of depends out how, how or where you train and, and what the that gym is. It sounds like that's you know when you went to Tenth Planet, kind of a no gi thing going on and. And that's what you Kinda. what you did. <laughs> so uh, that that's that's cool. Do you have any any favorite techniques you'd like to talk about real quick? Um, I am uh, like everyone really getting into leg locks. Um, I really like the four eleven uh, slash honey hole slash saddle slash you know whatever else it is uh, the Japanese name. Um, and uh, I really like the truck. Um, I, I love getting the truck from the back. I love truck rolling from turtle. I love all the submissions. And it's a great, powerful position because if you don't know what it is, um, it's it's going to be a lot harder to defend. So a lot of times you can even out a skill gap between you and like a really good, you know, practitioner that they're better than you overall. But if you can get them in the truck, you might you might be able to navigate those waters a little bit better. Yeah, that's uh, that's always fun when you kind of get somebody confused, <laughs> and they get uh, make some mistakes for you. That's kind of nice. Yeah, totally. So, tell me uh, a little bit about uh, your website. So, my website is hypercentagemartialarts.com, dot com, and um, we are a site that is dedicated to using uh, science, data, and game theory to. Um, to steal a, a phrase from the BJJ Brick podcast, like kind of flatten the learning curve of uh, a, a newer student, um, which is not necessarily like a, like a brand new student, but even like a blue belt that they've kind of hit all the bases of the fundamentals. And now they're starting to circle back and say, OK, like, what's the stuff I really need to focus on? And the way we do that is simple. We watch hundreds and hundreds of real matches, gi, no gi, IBJJF, sub only. And we even watch actual street fights and we compile all that data and then we translate it into real actionable information about what's really high percentage. Because, you know, when I was starting out and maybe when you were starting out, Byron, um, people have wildly different opinions about what works. And there's people confuse what works for them with what should work for everyone. You know, like you get that that six foot tall guy with legs like longer than your whole body. And he's like, Oh yeah, triangles are super high percentage. You should try them. And it's like, well, yeah, like God built you to be a triangle machine. <laughs> you know, I'm a skinny little dude. I'm like five, five, like I'm not a triangle machine. Um, and there's, everyone has stories like that. Um, so, you know, high percentage is a way to kind of cut through all that. And we're not trying to like say that you shouldn't do things or what's clearly better. Like I try to avoid that. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, listen to your teachers, kids, like your, your teacher knows best. Um, but you know, having an objective information point to say, okay, like this is just what the math says. You can do anything you want, but if you want to play the odds of, you know, rolling the dice, um, that's what my side is for. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really cool. I, I urge, I'll put a link in the show notes, but you could find it just by typing in high percentage martial arts.com and you pop right up, uh, it's like you're discovering truths about jujitsu that you know you're just using the data that's available, you're doing a lot of work, and you have a kind of a unique background in the jujitsu world to help do this. What did you do uh, before <laughs> you you started doing this sort of thing? So I used to work at a university, uh, Cal State Monterey Bay, um, and I was a data analyst there. And I, I had access to a huge database, and I, the team I was part of, our job was to figure out why students drop out of college, basically. And, you know, it's a very complicated question, and there's teams of people that are working on this all over the country all the time. And, you know, there's really no one answer. It's it's too complex. 
So I had that kind of mindset of like figuring out how to use data to solve problems. And I remember I was at a tournament. I was with my coach, Daniel Thomas, in Monterey. Um, And we're watching a match, and he's like, you know, I think if you get a takedown, you're going to win like 60% of the time. And I kind of looked at him, and and he's like, but if you pass guard, I bet it's more like 80%. And just him saying that, kind of just talking out loud, it started this like obsession in my brain that I was like, you know, that wouldn't be that hard to figure out if that's true or not. You just, you know, the matches are all there. Everyone puts them on the internet. You just need someone that has the time and the inclination to watch them. And, you know, at the university I worked at, we were looking for things that made like a 5% difference. So for something to make like a 60% difference is huge in my mind. You know, if someone could say, hey, if you get a takedown, you're going to win 60% of all matches. Well, then we would all be drilling takedowns all the time, which it's funny in BJJ, we kind of do the opposite. Like we, you know, you have to force us to do takedowns at a lot of schools. Um, so that kind of started the journey of, of just watching the fights, gain the data. And I wrote an article called, uh, I watched a hundred white belt fights. Here's what's high percentage. And I just kind of put it up and like overnight it got shared on Reddit and it, it got, you know, several thousand views in a very short time. And, and that's when I knew I said, there's like people, this is helpful. This isn't just like me blogging about, you know, why I like the truck, you know, this is something that is really actionable. So that's, that's where the, the website was kind of born out of. Yeah. I was uh, talking with my wife and earlier today and she's like, well, who are you interviewing today? And I, I said, Louis Martin. And she goes, who's that? Which <laughs> I could have said anybody. I could have said Bernardo Faria or uh, <laughs> Josh Singer or anybody's name. And she just said, well, who's that? <laughs> so I said, well, he's this really cool guy. He, he runs this website and he, he talks about statistics and jiu-jitsu and kind of how things work. And she's been training for quite a while, but she's a white belt. I said, if you want to compete, it, which she doesn't, she doesn't have any desire to compete. But if she did, I like, I think the first place we would turn would be his, this website and we would see how these matches unfold. And then we could work backwards and see how we want to construct your game. And she's like, Oh, that's a cool idea. So how does this work? And you know, well, it's, it's this particular example. It's very important to be able to pass someone's guard in a white belt match and to be in the position to pass their guard and that sort of thing. And it was just kind of a cool thing to explain to her uh, what you do and, and, and how easy it was for her. And like, this is a different way to look at jiu-jitsu because we all try to make it like a complete game. And, and we all could spend a lot of time doing different chokes and variations of, a, of, of submissions or whatever. But it seems like a lot of times when you go to compete, it doesn't work out. Like, it's, 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 the opponents are ready for that or they've dealt with that or, or whatever is happening there. But there are a lot of patterns at, and they do kind of happen over layers like white belt patterns and blue belt patterns and black belt patterns. Like, like things are happening in these matches that are predictable. Um, you know, and of course any one match could be, you know, crazy. You get a flying triangle in a white belt match, but most matches kind of, uh, are typical. I mean, statistically speaking, (laughs) Um, and, and so I think that's there's a huge value. So anybody who is white belt, blue belt, like anybody, it, it coaches, this is a great resource for a coach. If you're coaching white belts, I coached a white belt earlier this week that was uh, going to compete, and he already did. But uh, maybe it was a couple weeks ago that I was coaching him. I was like, what do you want to work out for the tournament? He goes, I'm, I'm working on triangles. It's like, so we drilled triangles for a while. And, it, you know, it was good. But I should have said, I should have, if I had the data that I had here, I would have said, we need to work on uh, sh- like a guard pass. Or we need to work on this sort of thing. And uh, I, I just think it's valuable information yeah, for students and for coaches alike. So let's... Yeah, triangles are one of the, the lowest performing submissions from the guard at the white and blue belt level. And not only are they low performing, because arm bars from the guard are too... But with an armbar from the guard, when it fails, statistically, you typically will reset. You'll end up back in the guard. Whereas with triangles, when they fail, like uh, I think it was like like three out of four times or something, um, you end up getting your guard pass. So um, how'd the guy do? I don't know. Did he compete already? He, he, yeah, he did, he did fine. He he he. He did well, but it wasn't a triangle fest, you know. Like <laughs> he was he was trying, but it, it being. Um, it, it came down to just overall jiu-jitsu versus somebody else's overall jiu-jitsu. And th- that's 
typically how these matches go. Like you, you kind of have an idea how it's going to happen and you end up, you know, getting somebody on your back or you get somebody else's back or, you know, these things happen. And, and that's why we need to uh, kind of have a, a whole game plan out, which he did have. But um, just to know, like, what is important here? Like, um, you know, just to talk about, dive a little deeper in this white belt thing, how like cross collar chokes, white belts aren't landing these. Right, exactly. From they God. are uh, the lowest percentage submission uh, period across the board, not not just from guard. So um, we watched 100 white belt matches. Big disclaimer, all of these were in the gi, um, but we have some other stuff for no gi. But in the 100 gi matches, uh, there were 22 uh, cross-collar chokes attempted from the guard, and only one of them succeeded. So that's one in 200 people finished a, a match with a cross collar choke. Um, and you know, the only positive thing I could say about it is if you fail your cross collar, you know, you're probably not going to lose position like a triangle. Um, but you know, everyone knows that that's something that you can expend as much energy as you want in a cross collar choke. Um, whereas, you know, sweep attempts from the guard are higher percentage than submission. So it might be better to focus your effort on sweeping from the guard instead of, you know, trying a super low percentage choke. Yeah. And of course these things are individualized. If you, if you're white belt and you've got a great cross choke, you know, go for sure. it. But uh, m- most cross collar chokes I attempt aren't even a real attempt. It's, I want you to move your hands for me and address, address my hands. And then I'm going to work from that position. Totally. And, yeah, totally. And, but I don't know if white belts are, are doing that necessarily, you know, like, so that works for me because I don't gas out my forearms trying to choke somebody when it's probably not going to, when I can tell it's not going to work. Uh, I I will, if I think it's going to (laughs) work and that's my own mistake sometimes, but uh, it's, it's knowing the difference between is this tight or, you know, do they have room still? Uh, Are they defending it properly? And, and, and what kind of work on there? So uh, if, if you were to give, let's just say um, I'm a white belt and I'm going to compete in a month or so, uh, what should I be focused on and why? So to give like really concrete advice, um, I'd probably break it into four pieces. Um, the first piece is you, you have to attack, uh, in a, in a tournament, um, the rules are, are structured and in, inherently to reward offense. You are not rewarded for defense in most tournaments. And what that means is that if I, uh, slap a submission on you and I don't get it, I still get rewarded in the form of an advantage if I get close, right? Um, so I'm rewarded for offense, but you don't get a reward for defending it, that you won't get an advantage. Just like if you uh, escape from the mount or you escape from the side mount, you're not rewarded for that. Yeah. So that tells you a lot in that the game is built around offense. And if you have absolutely 100% perfect defense, in theory, you still lose because you have to do something offensive. So that's step one is um, we have data that shows that if you are the first person to attack, whether it's a, a takedown or even a, a attempted takedown or a guard pull, you're statistically a little bit more likely right off the bat to win. Um, so one is be offensive. Two is get a takedown. Takedowns are basically like a death knell um, from a statistical standpoint, like your, your odds of winning are, um, closer to 70% if you can score a takedown. If you can't, then you need to pull guard, of course. And that is fine because statistically that's about neutral. It doesn't seem to make too much of a difference for white belts. Um, uh, so yeah, two is get a takedown. Three is pass the guard. Uh, if you pass guard, 65% of winners pass the guard in their matches and, uh, only 12% of losers pass guard. Um, and, and still go on to loss. So, you know, it's possible to pass guard and go and lose the match, but it's not likely. Um, and then the last one is to, uh, and some people will hate me for this, but um, consider not attempting submissions um, because most submission attempts at the white belt level fail. And a lot of times when they fail, they result in you losing a position. So if you've scored a takedown and you've passed guard, you've essentially won the match. And it's not that you should not try to submit someone, but um, you need to weigh the risk reward carefully. Maybe it's better to stay in side mount or mount. And this is something I talk about on the site. People say, well, you know, I, uh, it's very trendy to say, I don't care about the points. I'm, I'm always going for the submission. Um, and I think 
especially newer students, we say that just because that's what other people that we like say, like that's what Crone Gracie says. So, you know, he says it, we feel like we should say it. Um, but of course we're not Crone Gracie. It's, you know, jujitsu is a control based game. So even if it's, if you're thinking self-defense, um, if you, if you can get mount on someone, you've won the fight, you know, the fight is over. You're, you're going to control them until, you know, they're, they're tired or, or whatnot. Um, so to me, like it's a really great reflection on your jujitsu if you can dominate on points because that means that you won the positional game and that's what jujitsu is about. Submission, a lot of that's up to your opponent. Um, so yeah, just to review, uh, be aggressive, get a takedown, pass the guard, and then think about positional dominance before submission. Yeah, it, you know, you, you might say this. <laughs> people may not like to hear the, uh, you know, don't go for the submission necessarily, but it what's working. At this level, what that tells me is white belt defense is generally better than white belt attacks. Uh, and if you think about it, white belts are being at the gym attacked by blue belts, purple belts, and on up, you know, with arm bars and triangles, and they're having to defend these, uh, this level of attack themselves. And, and so their defense is naturally built a little stronger than their offense. And it's, it, it makes sense. Like it's, it's really hard for another white belt to arm ball another white belt if he's training with, you know, blues and purples that are arm barring him sometimes and he can escape out of those. Um, it, right. it, it, and it might just change, like, don't not go for the submission, but do it in a smart way. Sometimes if you can get up 10 or 12 points in a match, the person is going to be fairly desperate to make something happen. And then the submission may be a little easier to catch. And, and the, the way the point system is organized you should be in a better and better spot to submit somebody as you increase your point total. And uh, it should be less risky for you to, to do these sort of things. Yeah, and I should even say that, um, you know, the alternative to that is, well, what if there is no points and you're in one of those types of uh, scenarios? And then, you know, I haven't done a lot of data on sub-only kind of matches. Um, but just from a game theory standpoint, if you think about what are the positions that give you the most access to the most dangerous submissions, um, most of those positions are on top. So having an end goal to get on top and really aggressively prosecute a top game is the same thing as saying that you need to be offensive. Um, because when you're on the bottom, there's only really one offensive position, which is the guard anywhere else on the bottom's probably not good. Right. Um, so, you know, and later on what we see is like once you're at the purple belt level, like, you know, purple belts have very, very dangerous guards. So things start to change. But in the beginning, like it's all about being offensive, getting on top and getting to those high percentage positions where you're going to either finish the match or you're just in such control that that you have an advantage. Yeah. And as for white belt specifically, they need to learn how to deal with somebody's guard. What type of guard are they going to be presented with typically? Close guard, close hundred percent, yeah, 100%. like nine ninety five. It's all close guard, um, and I talked about this on the High Percentage podcast a yeah. couple episodes back. That um, you know, close guard is um, it is the starter guard. It's the one that we all learn. Ninety percent of us learn in the beginning, um, but the main reason that we learn close guard uh, is one, it's traditional. Um, it's just the the old you know roots guard from from the you know Gracie Jiu Jitsu, um, but two it it's the self defense guard and and it and that's a good thing. It's good that we incorporate self defense in our training. Um, but you know when you start thinking about the tournament, it's it's no better or worse than other guards, right? It's um, people say it's an easy guard to learn, but I kind of don't think so. I think, is it really that much easier than like the butterfly guard to learn? Like close guards can actually be, I think pretty complex. Um, so all that is to say is that, um, if you're competing at the white belt level, like you, it's, it's not a bad idea to structure a game around beating someone's close guard. Um, because that's the guard that you're going to encounter. And that's a big advantage you have knowing that, you know, eventually you'll be a blue, purple, brown belt, and you'll have no idea what your opponent's game is, and it'll be a problem because, you know, you you could have a really good, uh, you know, knee shield, and then you go up against a leg locker, and they have their game is just a good counter for yours, um, and then there's a randomness 
that you'll miss the days when you were a white belt and you're like, God, I, I, I miss, you know, when I just knew that it was closed guard and I, could, <laughs> you know, and if, if, and that's not that hard to do structure a counter game. Like it's about staying on your feet, emphasizing open guard passes and, and not passing, you know, on your knees, like just those little things will really help maximize your probability of, of winning, you know, there's nothing assured, but that's kind of what game theory is all about is, is playing the odds as much as you can. Yeah, and you talk about close guard. Uh, if 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 my goal is to not be in close guard as a top player, that's usually uh, not not super hard to avoid. Like a close guard, the the benefit of close guard is you kind of are working almost two guards that you have to have defeated before you get your guard pass. You have to first break open the guard and then pass an open guard a lot of times. And so right. that's kind of a benefit for a defensive player. Like, well, he's got to pass this and they'll probably have to pass my half guard or pass my, you know, butterfly hook or something else that you could present them versus, uh, you know, if you want to play half guard, once they pass your half guard, then they're through that system. Um, that's an advantage, but it is, if you think about how hard it is to get the close guard, if, unless they play on their, you know, kind of on their knees and, and that sort of thing. It can be super hard to get a close guard at somebody. You could that could be your whole goal for the whole time and not accomplish it because they're they're wise to that and they're just just avoiding close guard. I I still um, that's often a priority for me is to just not begin someone's close guard even at black belt level. You know I don't want to be in a purple belt's close guard. That's going to be a nightmare. They're going to be. Right. All sorts of posture control and breaking my base down, and and my arms are going to be out of position at the fight to get them back in. I'm nowhere near passing somebody's close guard when I'm stuck in the middle of it. Like, oh man, just to not be in it, it's a good thing. So you mentioned like standing up, and, and man, that just takes away so many tools as far as their close guard goes. Yeah, and it's it's one of those basic things that you can do, which is you know having a like rejecting the mentality of close guard. Um, and, and, you know, if someone has uh, – if a, a white belt has a pretty decent close guard, like what do they have? They have, you know, their arm bar, their triangle, collar choke, and maybe a couple sweeps. And suddenly you're standing up and you're out of their range. Um, you've taken away a huge portion of their toolbox. And whether you're really good at standing guard passes or not, you still won that, that equation because you've taken away like a bunch of their techniques – and uh, I was talking to someone else about this the other day. When you watch like, um, like the championship level white belts, if that is such a thing, but like the people that are competing in like the large, you know, white belt tournaments, sure. um, the the really good white belts do not use close guard. Like they've jumped uh, the gun a little earlier, and they're using like you know the early versions of like the De La Hiva, um and you could tell a big part of their success is they're just befuddling their opponents like, whoa, this isn't close guard, you know. Um, and I want to say like I'm not anti close guard at all. I'm just saying like that is the, the common meta at the white belt. So it's worth thinking about some ways that you can beat that. Yeah, it's I mean, you could think about how to get the best close guard and then put that up against everybody else's games or you can kind of go around that. Uh, but you realize that some some guards are a little bit more tricky or refined and and then you may or may not have success with that i mean it's just kind of a strategic thing you talk a lot about game theory um that's kind of a, a interesting i think when i hear game theory i think of that uh with john van neumann is that right like he uh he kind of came up with like the yeah prisoner's dilemma and uh in like which strategically what should you do in, in the prisoner's dilemma is like you could um you could you and me both get arrested for this, you know, this crime that we did together. I could confess or, or, or rat you out, or we could both be quiet, or we could both rat each other out. And like the different penalties that they had for that, you know, what's a, what's strategically the right thing to do? So it's kind of it. And then you could take this same principle and move it to anything where you have two competing uh, things that use strategy. Like what's the right thing to do? And and so I think that's a it's an interesting approach to look at jiu-jitsu with kind of a game theory perspective. Yeah, I think jiu-jitsu, um, one, it's it's a good framework to look at jiu-jitsu or like a good mental model. Um, and it's um, – game theory is great because any any time that you have competitors and there's winners and losers, like you can apply game theory. So you see it in economics. You even see it in like warfare. 
Um, poker is infamous for having a really well-developed game theory, and you always use math. The, the example um, I've talked about before is Monopoly, right? Like Monopoly, everyone knows that game. The way most people play it is you land on a tile, and if you can afford it, you buy the property, and then you just kind of hope that other people land on enough properties that you win. Um, the way game theorists uh, approach Monopoly is they ran like a simulation of thousands of uh, times going around the Monopoly board and dice rolls, and they like heat mapped everything, and they figured out there's like a set of like six tiles that you will uh, mathematically land on like 25 percent more than any other tile, and that if and those are all properties, and if you bought those properties, like you're gonna drastically increase your chances of winning, and. Why I like that model is that it it says, okay, there's no real way to guarantee a win, but like this is how you maximize your odds. And I think in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, that's a good way to approach it, which is there is an element of randomness, which is like we don't know who we're going against and what their, their attributes are, but we could use large amounts of data to maximize our odds, um, if nothing else, just by ignoring things that we know are not likely to work, you know, like all that time that you spent drilling the Americana for Mount, uh, when it's a low percentage submission, whereas like the highest percent submission that there is for white belts is the arm bar from the Mount. So, um, just like tripling down on your arm bars, like that's going to help maximize your chances. And it's a technique you could use in a lot of different positions. And that's just game theory. Looking at all these numbers and, and these things, how how much is it that the person that is able to pass the guard is just a better grappler? How, is there a way to kind of factor this in? If I mean, if you're getting armbar from mount, not only did you get mount, you passed my guard, you maybe possibly took me down. Like you might just be the better grappler that day, and and you could have done a number of things. And, and the armbar from the guards, what you or armbar from mount, which you chose. How is there any way to kind of control for just the better grappler versus what what they're doing? Yeah, that's a great question, Byron, and, and I think about that all the time because I don't want to provide data that's useless and people are like, oh, well, you know, no shit. If you pass the guard, you win. Like if you pass the guard and you get a takedown, you're just – you're better, right? Um, and it could – you probably are. Um, but one, there's no way to quantify that that I know of from a data standpoint, just like who's better. Um, but two, it, I think it's kind of a chicken in the egg thing, right, which is um, – did you make correct decisions because you're better or are you better because you made correct decisions? You know, we all know people in the gym that they're very, very good, but in tournaments they don't do as well as you might think they will. Um, and I think some of that is that they have a different decision making process in the gym when the rule set is different. Um, that then when tournament time comes, you know, like there's some people that are defensive masters in the gym. And when the clock goes for seven minutes and, you know, they're just like really difficult to submit and you just think, man, they're so good. Like they're, it's hard to pass their guards, hard to submit them. Well, in a match, they might lose just by virtue of being on the bottom and like losing to an advantage because they're not, um, they're not being offensive enough. So I don't really know the answer to that question, but my goal is to, give people like a, a set where they can make like the most optimal decisions in their training and in their tournament strategies that they could win despite being an inferior grappler kind of all around, but they're just, they're good at a specific set of skills. Yeah. I, I guess looking at it, like the the people that win matches, what are they doing? And, and whether they're a little bit better or not, like <laughs> it's important to see what are the winners doing, what are the the top performers doing, and 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 work with that because it's clear that you know it's important to be able to pass someone's guard as a white belt. And I think about white belt guard passing. Um, it's typically it just happens because the guard kind of fails, or like like you're saying about the triangle choke. A lot of times we'll get you a guard pass <laughs> at a white belt level. It's uh. So, you know, if you could pair that, I was talking with my wife about this, you know, if we were to do this, we would start working on your guard passing uh, more than probably anything else. And it puts you in a spot where you can get on top in a match and then and then pass the guard. I think that would be, looking at these, this data, a good strategy. 
And right. And I think that like, um, so when I was a white belt, I don't know, I'll ask you, you tell me when, when I'm done, but like, I only really learned like one guard pass when I was a white belt, bro. Like, and, and that's, you know, I should have learned more, but, um, but I had to get like tested. I had a curriculum I had to, t- you know, and we just learned the basic like double stack guard pass. Um, and then, but then I compare that to like all of the defensive skills I learned and I, I spent a ton of time, um, you know, learning good stuff. Like, of course you have to learn like your mount escapes and like your, your hip, your hip ups and stuff like that. Um, but you know, it was certainly de-emphasized just like takedowns were de-emphasized. Um, and that's where I think it's, you know, the data can help a little bit because, um, you know, I spent such a small fraction of my time learning something that was actually really, really a key indicator of being successful. How many guard passes do you think you, you knew when you were a white belt? I don't know. I don't think a lot, but I don't think the, I don't think it's a quantity thing. I think it's, it's as a white belt, how is I passing guard? And I would venture to guess that most of the time I pass somebody's guard as a white belt is because their guard failed to hold me. Like I didn't do a thing that made it work. It's right. their leg hit the ground and it should have been up it, or their butterfly had no like tension in it. You know, they didn't keep that together and I was able to kind of scramble past it. I mean, if you count scrambling past a guard, a guard pass, maybe I had a couple, but uh, I don't remember what guard pass. I, I don't, So I don't remember what kind of a guard pass I liked as a white belt. So maybe zero technical guard passes, but you know, you get in a guard and you, the goal is to get around the legs to side control or mount and you try to make it happen. And it's, it's tough, but when somebody's guard is another white belt, um, it's possible if they could l- have like a lapse in concentration, you could scramble past it. Yeah, totally. And this gets to like, um, the, the difference between like the self-defense and the sport aspect of jujitsu, which is like when you start out, most schools probably are, are thinking more of the self-defense route. So they give you like a super defensive skill set. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Like that's great. But then when you decide you want to compete, um, you have like a very defensive skill set in an arena that you need to be offensive. And, um, it's, it's kind of like you said, like, um, you know, so much of the techniques that you've honed has been under the assumption that you're losing, which is like you, you've gotten, you know, when I was a white belt, like I was pretty good at defending from the mount and the side mount. Like I spent a lot of time there just getting smashed like everyone else does. Um, but then you get in a tournament and it's like, cool, like now you need to focus on being the other guy. Um, and you're like, oh, well, actually I'm, I'm more comfortable, you know, losing. <laughs> and I feel like when I started competing, when I was, you know, younger, like I, I maybe like subliminally found ways to get myself in bad positions almost because I, I that was like the devil I knew, you know, I don't, there's so much here that we can keep, keep, uh, diving into as, as far as like this game theory stuff. I do want to cover a little bit about, so we talked about white belts um, actually, I want to go way back because I've totally blown something that I wanted to just to mention or just ask you about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, Mark just has a negative on my interviewing skills, but anyway, you mean God damn it, Byron! You, you, I'm <laughs> sick of this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did, uh, you know, you did. You studied at uh, at a university and, and tried to figure out why you know certain students were dropping out and, and any predicting factors. What's so? What would you learn from that? Like, what predicts? students that will drop out their freshman year or stick with it like did you guys find much there so yeah way back to the beginning of the interview (laughs) right um yeah we did so one there's no easy answer that's why it's so hard um and actually a fun fact um college retention rates have moved very little since like the 1970s so even though the college experience has changed so much. Like we're not really much better at retaining students than we ever kind of have been since we started collecting info. Um, and, uh, basically what it kind of came down to is like the first, the early parts, like your freshman year, um, you know, students that, that started off, um, you know, with having to do remedial courses, uh, or started off having a bad first semester, you know, that's like a death sentence as far as like your, your statistical odds. And, um, it's even a model I used in high percentage, which is like the tempo model, which is, um, if you start a match behind, 
you're, you'll tend to stay behind until you lose, which is why it's very important to be aggressive and go out and make the first move because in BJJ, um, there's no resets. That's what's great about the sport. Um, so unlike in like football, like in football, if I score a, a field goal, like we, we all reset, we go back, there's a kickoff and we all get to do it again. Right. But in BJJ, you know, I keep my leads and if I mount you, like we're not going to get broken up unless we like go out of bounds, but then we just reset from the same thing. So it's kind of like in college, like if you stumble early, you are going to be behind until you drop out. And in competitive Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like if you suffer even a small loss early, like, um, you know, like a takedown, that's going to spiral out of control where you, you won't be able to fight your way out of that unless you, you get lucky and, you know, throw up a submission or your opponent makes a big mistake. Yeah, that's interesting. And we talked about takedowns and that sort of thing. Um, I think w- one thing <laughs> with with the takedowns is to be able to try to judge if you're going to be able to win this fight or not, the takedown battle. And the, a simple thing I've told a lot of students that compete is, does this person feel like, you know, this person at the gym? Does it feel like you're tying up with with Bill when you're when you're working your stand up because you know we got a guy named Bill and he's a good wrestler does it feel like that or does it feel like just another person that's about your skill level or maybe maybe lower because you need to be able to tell <laughs> right away if a person wrestled and if right. you didn't wrestle you're gonna hand him two points from the get go and so and you could you could tell I I could tie up with you uh, and and Lou I could tell if you wrestled or not by the way you tie up with me. Like, yeah, I could feel that, and so just to kind of like if you type somebody like this dude is he's wrestled, it's time to pull guard and try to work that game versus, you know what, I want to work top game, and yeah, probably if you put him on his back, he's probably not gonna do great. But are you gonna hand him two points from the get go? Possibly, mm-hmm. probably, maybe even. <laughs> so I don't know where I'm going with that, but um, just to not like you say, not to hand him the points right at the beginning, make the first move. And uh, kind of mentioned with white belts anyway, I think you said that it's kind of a neutral thing to pull guard, whether you win or lose. Um, yeah, it- we found – we did a whole first move study and we looked at um, – uh, I'm trying to think if we did just white or if we did blue. I think we did white and blue and we found that at the white belt level – no, you know what? We did all the belts. Okay, that that's was the, the only- one you did like 10 of each? Yeah, we did twenty. We did twenty of each, so twenty white, twenty blue, etc. And then half were gi, half were no gi. Um, and I actually wasn't the the lesson I learned from that was that twenty um, is not enough at any individual belt level. Um, so I kind of had stopped doing that. But you know, we already had other white and blue belt data to compare that. And what we found is that like when you're a blue belt, being first gives you um, like a decent advantage as far as first takedown, first guard pull, or even the first takedown attempt. Um, but when you're a white belt, it's a huge indicator because, you know, this is kind of common knowledge. It's like, you know, aggressive players tend to do better, um, in, in, you know, competitive Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So, you know, you got to be aggressive. And what we found for white belts was that even if you get a take, if you attempt a takedown, you fail, you're still more likely to win the match. Um, just based on, you know, you're, uh, taking the initiative in the match that changed as a, as a blue belt, but, um, you know, it speaks to the, the, the power of initiative and tempo, you know? Yeah. And that, so that's, uh, maybe is impossible to get a glimpse into this, but like if you do a takedown and fail and still win, like you're not clearly a way better grapple than that person. Like it's at least a competitive match to where if you blast your takedown, get it, Go to mount right away. Submit the person. That okay? You probably could have done that, you know, ten times in a row with that person, it, 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 or done any submission or any guard pass. Like you're just different level, but right. because something failed, it indicates this is going to be a good match. This is going to be close. Um, you shot in, you failed, and, and if you still could, you know, have something that important get shut down and and, and make a good fight out of it. Like, I don't know, maybe there's indicators like that that would indicate that a match is close. Or maybe if, if the two competitors each score several points, and, and what, if we each get past five points, uh, what's the deciding factor on who wins that match? It would be a thing as far as, like, it was competitive. It wasn't, you know, 20-0 before Byron submitted. <laughs> right, or even, like, um, yeah, that'd be a good way to do it, is, like, you track 
the point total for each competitor, and that gives you a, a feeling of like of all the matches are are white belt matches competitive, or is it kind of like one guy just steamrolls the other? You know? Yeah. And I don't know the answer to that I. I mean, just from watching a lot of them, um, yeah, I don't know. I've I've seen a lot that are, you know, back and forth. Like, I've noticed with white belts, like, there's no guarantees. Like, a lot of times a white belt will, you know, they'll do everything right. They'll get a mount, and then they'll just blow it. They'll lose the lead, and, and it, you know, it's back and forth. But, you know, once you get to, like, the blue belt level, like, if you're, if, you know, if someone mounts you, it's pretty much over, like, cause at that level, they're not going to make mistakes at, at the same frequency, you know, like they're going to, they're going to play it safe. They're going to go for submissions that are high percentage. Um, it's kind of like what you talked about, like so much of, you know, what you do in the beginning is you just capitalize on other people's mistakes. Um, but in the long run, that's not really a strategy. That's just, you know, something that you, you take advantage of opportunities, but you can't depend on those always being there, I guess. I think it would be harder to watch a hundred white belt matches where each white belt scored more than five points. Like it's just hard to find that data and, and filter it through everything else. But, uh, it, so we talked a bit about now to, you know, get back to where we were before I derailed us. <laughs> uh, blue belt advice, as far as you got a blue belt, she's going to compete in, in a couple of weeks or whatever. Uh, you know, what is important for her to know, uh, before she, sets out to compete, you know, what should she be working on to, to be ready? Um, so I don't have it as well defined as the white belt cause I've mined a lot of white belt data at this point and the blue belts I'm kind of like in the midst of, and we're even starting to, to do some purple belt stuff. Um, but with blue belts, um, it's it, one with a white belt, I'd be more comfortable saying like, Hey, it's okay to just be really aggressive. And I'd use that word aggressive, um, but with blue belts, it's a little bit different because we see submission rates from the guard are starting to tick up at blue belt. And also blue belts can submit each other from anywhere. Like we broke down where the submissions come from and it was, it was very evenly spread. Um, but I'd still say overall, if you get a takedown, you have a very, uh, strong, you know, probability of doing well in the match. Um, also for blue belts, um, the two most high percentage chokes is still the arm bar, uh, which it is for white belts as well. Um, and also the bow and arrow choke um, is very, very high percentage. It's more high percentage than the rear naked choke, certainly. Um, so those are two chokes that I, I would, you know, statistically you should add to your arsenal. Um, and then the last thing is we started looking at guards that blue bells incorporate, and we found that. Um, Blue belts that are doing well in their matches, uh, they're incorporating like three different guards seamlessly, which is, you know, they're, they're, they're fluidly switching between like their De La Hiva and their spider guard and their lasso guard. Um, so they've, you know, they've started as opposed to just like they have their one guard that they're really, you know, using a lot like the closed guards. That makes sense. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So start, you know, start start learning how to chain your guard attacks together, I suppose would be the best advice for that. Um, but you know, more than that, like if you can get on top and get a takedown, do it. That top is still a huge indicator of success. Yeah. But you got to be a little more conservative when you're passing. You can't just kind of throw it all out there and, and, and try not to get arm barred. If, if a blue belt setting up an arm bar, you need to deal with that because they probably have a decent arm bar. Yeah. We were talking about that before, uh, we, we went on the air that, um, you know, a huge majority of submissions from the bottom fail as with a white belt. In fact, the submission rate of all white belts period was like 30 something percent, I think. So most of them are failing from everywhere. Um, but from the bottom, they're even lower. They're like abysmally low. So sometimes, um, if you're out of ideas, a decent strategy, if you're stuck in someone's guard is to let them attempt a submission because, um, statistically they're not going to succeed and you will, hopefully get a pass out of that. Now, you know, that's not maybe the best strategy because, again, you're banking on someone making mistakes. But, you know, if you're having trouble opening up a closed guard, like maybe throw an arm out there uh, and and see if you can get someone trying to triangle you and, you know, there's a good chance you'll be able to pass. But, yeah, a blue belt, maybe not as good idea. Yeah, it goes up and up, I'd imagine, with how bad that idea gets. But, uh, you know, if you're confident with... 
defending the the submission that you're going to try to get them to take the bait as if as an option yeah i mean just in my when i'm rolling in the gym like depending on who i'm rolling with like i got a pretty good arm bar defense uh you know from top and and um you know, sometimes if I see someone going for an arm bar, like I get a little bit happy and I'm like, cool, like I'm going to do my, my stack pass now, you know, on the arm bar. Um, so it's, you know, it's not a terrible strategy, but you know, then again, I'm not fighting at the world. So, so, uh, another thing, you know, so your, your website, it's a, it's a, has a lot of information on it. I think you could visit it multiple times and kind of pick up different things. And, and you, you talk to me about how this is a resource for like blue belts and white belts. This is a treasure chest for coaches. If it, coaches need to be looking at this data and, and, and realizing, you know, because so any particular one white belt might have a good, uh, you know, cross collar choke from the guard. That's fine, you know, go out there and do your thing. But as a whole, you know, like your group of students is going to fight another group of students, and that's what makes statistics. So, like, your students need to have. Uh, a couple of good ways to get past somebody's guard. Your students should have an idea how to get on top. Your students should should have maybe a preference to be sweeping over trying to do uh, a submission that will get their guard past. These sort of things. It, it just to me it makes sense as a coach that that this would be like a gold mine as far as information to help you do your job better. Yeah, I really hope so. And I've I've um, you know, it's mainly like, uh, students that, that reach out to me, but I, I do get coaches that find me. Um, and you know, I'm starting to think more and more about, um, ways that I can serve them and, and be helpful to them because I'm totally with them. Like, I think the way that we, that we structure jujitsu classes, like can be kind of archaic. Like I was, I, I religiously follow Donaher's Instagram and, you know, I think like today or yesterday he was talking about, um, you know, every time you go into class, like you need to have your agenda for like, this is what I'm working today, because if you're just sort of showing up, then uh, you're wasting your time. And and of course, he teaches high level competitors. So, you know, I'm sure, you know, he's he's in a mindset of like constantly improving and being able to test your skill. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that we could change with our curriculum there's a lot of stuff that we do just because we've always done it that way. Um, and you know, we, we, the closed guards, a great example. Like we tend to think of it in our mind as like the fundamental guard and then everything else becomes advanced in our mind. Um, but really like there's some other guards that are really powerful that I think are still on the level of, of, you know, closed guard as far as like how easy or challenging they are to learn. And, um, you know, maybe it's okay to rethink some of these things. I mean, jujitsu is a hundred years old, but the sport is, is actually very young. I mean, the sport has, you know, it's been around for, you know, a long, long time. I don't mean to say that it's young, but like, you know what I'm saying? It's really started taking off in the last like 10, 20 years or so. Yeah, I, I, I would agree to that. Um, and as far as the, um, the, not just the amount of competitors, but the frequency, that that events are happening and and then the the wide range of things that people are presented with as far as uh like like the white belt example is great i need to pass guard which guard close guard <laughs> black belt you need to pass guard which guard any of the guards and, right. and, and the, that's the problem you know with with a guard pa- that's the guard passer's problem is if you're going to play top and pass guard you and you're going to win a tournament where you have four matches you're probably going to have to deal with four different guards and successfully right. And to be able to to do that is is pretty impressive. Yeah, and that's why from the beginning I told myself like I don't really I'm not interested in doing black belt statistics because one I think there's some other people doing that maybe not with like massive numbers but they they do it at the you know they they show okay here's the medalists and here's the moves they employed but also like you know the black belts are doing stuff very different than what a newer student is doing so. To me, like I could do a detailed, you know, map of like, okay, like lapel guard was really dominant at the worlds this year, but you know, that doesn't mean that if you're a new student, you should read that and be like, oh, well, then that's what I gotta be doing. I gotta be doing lapel guard um, because you know they're competing on the cutting edge against people that are using the most like modern techniques, you know. Um, so I don't think it'd be as useful as 
you know, looking at, okay, what are the, the, what are the normal people doing? You know, even if you don't want to do that, um, it's still useful just knowing what your, what your opponents are going to be doing. It's good to know. Um, another thing that you've done is looked at street fights. <laughs> uh, interesting stats came out of that. Um, I, I think you said you watched like 200 street fights and, and kind of figured out what's happening uh, in them and, and how, how long they last, you know, are people getting knocked out or people getting seriously hurt, that sort of thing. Uh, or I urge everybody to go check it out. Cause I think that we all have just a, a little bit of interest in self-defense anybody who's training jiu-jitsu but what's happening in street fights yeah so the street fight thing is really fascinating because i never get any pushback when i do the bjj content people are just like great really interesting (laughs) you know i have a question but the self-defense stuff like people get in people get insane like it is it is such a trigger for people and i get the feeling that the people reading the self-defense stuff is like a whole different audience that, you know, they just see it on Facebook. They don't even read the article and they just comment like, this is trash. He's not thinking about this thing. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. He's, it would, he's not thinking about weapons or like when the, the BJJ people ask questions, I feel like they're coming from a place of like curiosity, but with the self-defense people, like they're looking to invalidate something. They're like, well, did you, did you specifically look at, you know, stuff from closed camera foot circuit TV. And I'm like, no, I looked at everything. They're like, oh, well then shit, it's not, you know, that doesn't (laughs) count nothing. So, and then they can just feel better about doing, you know, Krav Maga or whatever they're doing. I I get the feeling is what I'm making up in my head, I guess. Um, So yeah, I mean, street fights, it's, it's kind of the common knowledge. um, And I'm going to sound kind of elitist here because I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and that's, that's one approach to, to fighting. But, um, it's been, in my opinion, pretty proven. Um, you know, I can go online and I can look up BJJ in a street fight. I could type that into YouTube and I will see hundreds and hundreds of people using Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to defend themselves um, in, a, in a real situation. But when I go online and I type in, you know, Kung Fu in a street fight, I'm not going to find the same quality of data. I think you know what I'm saying. Um so as far as what happens, I mean, most street fights are short. They're less than a minute. I think we averaged it at like 45 seconds or so. Um, and I'm going to pull these data kind of from memory, so I might do some rounding errors or just completely get stuff wrong. Uh, but, you know, it's all on my site. You can check it out. So, yeah, street fights are short. Um, most knockouts, if they're going to happen, they're going to happen in like 10 or 20 seconds. So that's the most dangerous barrier that you need to clear after that. Um, People just tend to get tired. They don't have the energy to do that. Um, I think uh, the percentage of fights that go to the ground is like in the mid-70s. And most importantly, when they go to the ground, they tend to stay on the ground. So people don't really get up as often. And when they do get up, a big percentage of those people will just go back down to the ground. So it really speaks to the importance of ground fighting. Um, other thing, because people ask us all the time, what about multiple attackers? Like we track that, and um, we found that there are cases where some two people go to the ground, and then a mob tackles them, and it's just chaos. Um, so that is a completely valid thing to bring up, and it's a real thing in the data. But also, what we found, particularly amongst men, because we tracked men and women, is that when two males engage in fighting the likeliness of uh, a third party getting involved is actually surprisingly low as opposed to females. And I don't know why that is, but females, those for some reason, they tend to escalate into all out melees sometimes. Um, But with men, you know, I I think maybe it's that we have a kind of a more ritualistic form of fighting where it's like kind of let them fight is the mentality. Um, And then, you know, the last important takeaway is uh, if you are a female and you want to study self-defense, you absolutely need to think about hair pulling because like 80 to 90 percent of female fights involved clinching. And the clinching was basically getting a handful of hair with one hand and punching them with the other. And that's just a weird human thing that people with long hair do. I think I think you see a handle and you grab it. So um, and that made it impression on me because when I trained a lot more self-defense, 
um, you know, or even like women's self-defense classes that I've helped with. I didn't really see hair pulling come up as much as maybe it should have that, um, you know, defenses from someone just grabbing your hair and trying to just drag you down and, and then attack you um, is, is actually like 90% of, of assaults on females. Yeah. It just, just the, the difference between uh, two men fighting and two women uh, fighting is a lot of times the men will, will get that knockout within a few seconds and it look like uh, female fights tend to last longer than, than male fights. Um, right. Yeah. I forgot about that. Um, and again, I don't know why I think, probably the intuitive thing. Why do you think it is? I, I just think guys hit it harder. <laughs> like yeah, they're heavier exactly, people. Right? Yeah, that's and, what it and is. People aren't used to taking punches. <laughs> like, I don't want to get hit in the head. <laughs> but um, would it be really hit in the head by somebody who weighs 115 pounds or somebody who weighs 220? Uh, the 220 guy is going to knock me across the room. And uh, it's going to, I don't know, that's probably the, the, the biggest factor. And, and just upper body strength, men have bigger and more powerful shoulders. I'm, I'm guessing we're not throwing fancy kicks here most of the time. That'd be one thing to look at, like, how many people threw a kick and did that get you the win? Um, versus, uh, you know, so mostly just punches is what I'm guessing uh, people were, were doing. And, yeah, it's just, you know, it's street fights. The reason I don't do them is because they're actually kind of not interesting to me. Um, it's the same thing almost every time, I'm telling you. it's It's like... One guy rushes forward, he wings, you know, wide haymaker punches, and he just rushes forward. If he doesn't knock them out, they collide, they fall down to the ground, and whoever ends up on top will win. That's kind yeah. of what happens, like, m the vast majority of times. One, one thing I will say here about, like, with self-defense, and you mentioned, like, female self-defense, um, you looked at, like, two women fighting, and a lot of times in a women's self-defense situation, uh, she's, you know, fighting somebody she lives with or, you know, uh, a domestic partner or whatever. Um, and that's a whole different deal. Um, it's, you know, it, it, a fight, you know, you think of as a fair fight, a couple of mm. idiots square off or whatever. <laughs> it's different than uh, a, a spouse beating up uh, his his spouse or whatever. Like, that's a different, different thing altogether. And um, so... You know, I think a lot of women, you know, that that worry about self defense aren't worried about fighting another woman. Uh, they're worried about fighting, uh, you know, their boyfriend or whoever it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, male. And it's it's difficult for me to find videos of males and females fighting. And certainly, it's it's virtually impossible to find videos of like actual sexual assaults happening. So I can't really be helpful there. And that's your way that I think self defense gets into this. Pandora's box is it's it's such a broad topic and you know yeah. there's some data I can't collect and there's you know a lot of different kinds of fights and you know of course if someone if two dudes are fighting and I take out a cell phone camera and record it like that's a specific kind of fight versus you know I'm walking in a parking lot alone and someone just attacks me like those fights are not recorded um, you know, or much less. So yeah. I get it that it's just, it's just too, it, it's hard to do it. And if you want to be defensive and, and invalidate it, like you, you can definitely do that. That's why the tournament stuff is, is a little easier yeah. for me. And it's more interesting as far as like, what are we doing every day? You know, like the right answer for the woman who's worried about her boyfriend beating her up is to get a different boyfriend, like get rid of that guy. Like, yeah, that's right. the right move. <laughs> you know, you can learn how to block a punch in those moves, but the right move is that he's a scumbag and you got to find somebody who treats you better. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Um, one way, so you do a lot, you, you watch YouTube videos and that sort of thing. I wonder, you know, just to go off on a little tangent, if you could get like, data from you know, like police records as far as how many fights you know end up with with a third attacker getting involved end up with with both people going to the hospital that versus that sort of thing that would be a different way altogether to look at uh you know kind of look for some trends in, in street fights or whatever but um, that's I guess, fascinating i, I think yeah, you're, that's you're a great idea. Looking, at, looking at your youtube jiu-jitsu video so yeah, there was a study done by the military. It was actually by a cadet at um, the mil one of the military academies, maybe West Point. And he interviewed uh, returning um, soldiers from Iraq, and he did a, a statistical analysis of how many of them engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and how many of those went to the ground. Um, and he interviewed all these guys, and it's a fascinating study. 
Um, but unfortunately he only did like 50 people or something like that. So that's, that's a fairly small size. And, and I don't know, you know, I mean, there's only so many people that have been in hand to hand fights in Iraq. So I don't know how big it could be, but yeah, using other data, like from law enforcement, I think would be a great idea. Yeah. And I don't know if it, that might all just be publicly out there. You know, if you just ask for it in maybe in the newspapers, if there's still newspapers, I don't know, <laughs> or it might be something that is just hard to get to, but, mm. uh, it wouldn't take you, you wouldn't have to watch a million videos, <laughs> anything to get out of that. Man. <laughs> that's why, I mean, that's, you're doing a ton of work. I, sometimes I think like making a podcast is a lot of work and it can be sometimes, but I, uh, uh, no week am I watching, you know, hundreds of videos about, uh, people doing things um that that's i'm just impressed by uh kind of the amount of work that you're doing and and you're really you're you're bringing something to us that we don't know what's really happening in these matches and and and, and i think it's a very valuable thing that that you're doing you also write for uh jujitsu times and you're you're a pissy guy <laughs> uh one article you wrote fairly recently was um, three business practices that don't benefit students. Um, oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. You want to mention one of those and we'll kind of throw it out there and see what, what happens. I, uh, I, I you know, just how I'm, I'm impressed by how uh, kind of how many uh, pots you have on the, on the stove there. Yeah. I should mention um, I'm the managing editor for a website called you com, And, and um, we're a similar kind of, um, news uh you know article site as like you would see with jujitsu times okay um, we have we have our own writers and i'm one of them the other two are um jordan fernandez and sam kelly and they do a great job on the site um and we try to write you know good thought-provoking articles that are, are shareable and interesting um so if you want an alternative uh yes yeah, as far as the yeah, business for that, it's, it's you as in y-o-u not the letter you right you just right okay yeah y-o-u jujitsu.com um, and, uh, yeah, as far as the business practices, um, you know, I've been to a couple schools at this point and, um, I've been to, uh, you know, like something like 10th planet, which is, it's kind of like the counterculture, like, yeah, wear whatever you want, like pay when you can, you know? <laughs> um, and then I've been to like very commercial schools. Um, and I think I should say at the beginning, like jujitsu needs both, right? Because, I used to be someone that I thrived off of a super organized approach, um, and I, I thrived in a commercial school, but now I'm not, and that's totally fine. Um, maybe I'll change my mind again. Um, but, um, you know, as far as business practices, like I think in, in jujitsu, um, it's up to us as students and practitioners to ask the question of like, if a school is, asking us to pay money for something that it, we don't understand how it adds value to our training or makes us better training, but we very clearly understand how it makes other people money. Um, it's up to us to ask those questions and be like, why are we doing this? And jujitsu is not like any other industry. Like if the gym that I go to raises prices, like I'm going to go in and I'm going to ask, I'm going to be like, Hey, how, you know, why'd you raise the prices? Like I, you know, you need to improve your equipment. Like I'm very, you know, vocal, but we don't have permission to be that vocal a lot of times in jujitsu because there's this respect master student relationship. And I think that allows, you know, schools to maybe get away with stuff that they might not be able to in other industries. Yeah. It's, it's a weird, uh, relationship with, um, most of us that train our consider our coach as uh, some form of a friend, you know, maybe not best friend, but somebody that, that is friendly to you and that you enjoy to be around. And so to kind of have to be, deal with them in kind of a business relationship as well as a friendship thing, it, it kind of gets a little bit weird sometimes. It could get a little weird anyway. Yeah. It's, it's almost sort of like an inherent conflict that you have uh, sometimes because, you know, a jiu-jitsu, like, it starts as a simple business transaction, but, like, over time it becomes your family and you start really caring about these people. And as instructors, like, you, I think you need to be careful um, to be respectful of that because um, it's not like – it's not like the – it's not like car insurance where it's like, I'm leaving. 
fine, you're raising the prices. Like I'll go to Geico. I don't care. You know, <laughs> like it's, it's, we don't have that sort of, um, detachment from it. Um, so, you know, like I've trained at schools where, um, you know, you're training one day and then the next day they're like, Hey, uniform policy starting now, you know, you need to buy our geese. Um, and they need to be, uh, this color and, uh, you know, you need to have them in the next couple months. And, you know, to me, it's like, well, so then you're raising prices basically like that's going to cost a couple hundred bucks. I got a closet full of geese I can't use anymore. And, you know, i I'm not saying that uniform policies are bad because I think there's some schools that are doing it the right way. Um, But it's just one of those things that um, we need to be careful. Otherwise, it just becomes the norm. So if we have a problem with it, like we need to make sure that it's understood that it's controversial. Otherwise, other schools will just start doing it and and it'll become just this extra cost because jujitsu is freaking expensive, you know. It's expensive, and then on top of that, like you're faced with, you know, maybe having a mandatory contract or a uniform policy, and then you want to compete and stuff, and um, you know that stuff adds up, and it's it's okay to be protective of your pocketbook a little bit. Yeah, I can understand the value of uh, like as a, from a business to have contracts with students as far as having consistent money come in. And that sort of thing. I can also understand a student saying, man, I just want to try this place out. I don't know for sure if my schedule is going to change in a, in a few months with my work or whatever. Is there like a happy uh, kind of middle ground there? Yeah, like um, – so I think the Gracie Academy in Torrance um, – or I think it's called Gracie University now. Like they have a really good program, which is um, – they have mandatory contracts, and I, I think there's like six months or one year, and I don't like that. I like being able to do month to month, but what they do, which I think is reasonable, is they say, okay, you can do like 14 classes for free, um, and to me, like that's reasonable because after two weeks, like I've I've been to all the different classes, I've felt the different instructors out and their styles, and like, okay, you're making me commit, but at least like I got a good trial period, you know? The the other way is like, okay, you get one free class. You get one class with one instructor, even though we have three. And then after that, you know, um, you need to sign up for a year. And it's, it's like, um, it's like, man, can I, can I try longer? <laughs> you know, like it's, I, I think that's a reasonable thing to offer the students. Like give them a little bit of a trial period and give them different contract options. Um, you know, let them, you know, there's some schools that they have like a punch card system, you know, 10, 20 classes, do a three month contract or do a six month contract. We give you a discount, like giving students options is good. Like taking away options is bad, I think. Yeah. And it's just it, in the long run as a business, you want to make more money. And if, if you come in, you watch a class and then it's like, here, sign this for a year, you, you get to train jiu with us. Well, I'm going to think about that, and then I'm going to go check out another gym. And they, hey, come train with us for a week or two, and and, and we'll see if you're interested in, in in our monthly rates. Or we have a discount if you want to sign up for six months or whatever. Like, there's different things. They're just different. You know, neither one of those people are bad people, but they're just different ways to to uh, like problem solve with businesses, and which is going to make the business more money, which is going to make the students, the customers, happier in the long run. And it, it, you know, those things are different things to kind of weigh on a scale. Um, students are probably happier in a gym that's doing well. I mean, <laughs> if, if the lights are on and the bills are paid and it's clean and, and these sort of things, like that's a, you know, if coach comes in and he's a little bit mad because, you know, half of the students hadn't paid this month, like class may not go so well. <laughs> I don't know. There's a million different things you can, you can do with that. But, um, you know, it's a, it's just a, it's kind of a business decision and it's definitely something that could, could scare somebody away from training. If they only have one choice and you come in and you get smacked with that right away, it's like, well, maybe this isn't for me. I don't know for sure that I like this, but, uh, and most to use of your example, like that example you used of like, you know, you go to one school, you try a class and they, they put you to a decision versus the other one. That's like, Hey, come for the next week. Like you're going to go to that second one, right? Most of the time. Yeah, Cause they have, I think. they have a more attractive offer. So like, my position is, you know, and I'm not a business owner, so um, so I totally acknowledge that. Like, they have their own set of struggles. And I think that, you know, people in jiu-jitsu deserve to make money. And I think they deserve to be rich because it's not an easy job, you know. So I'm all for paying people to train. Um, but I think that the way to make the most money 
is to have a great jujitsu school with like great teachers, a really strong schedule, um, and, and to foster a positive culture. Like that's what I really love about Elliot Kelly's school in, um, El Dorado Hills Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is like, he's got a, you know, what real students care about, I think is they want a good schedule. They want options for like gi and no gi. Um, and they want like a really positive culture and maybe like a good competition program. Um, but I've never seen any students that has walked into a school and been like, Hey, do you have a uniform policy? Cause that's really important to me. Like I want to wear, I want everyone to be wearing the same thing. Like when people are in, uh, locker rooms and you know, they're talking about like, Hey, why do you really like the school? Man, I love the contracts. I love being on a year <laughs> contract. Sign me up, lock me in. That's great. Like, no, that's not what real students care about. They're like, man, the training here is really good. You know, this person, they brought on a wrestling coach. They're teaching wrestling classes once a week. They raise prices. I'm happy as hell. I can work on a new skill set. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I think a business owner should be pursuing. Yeah. That's, uh, like, like you said, I'm the same way. Don't own a gym. <laughs> Haven't had to deal with those pressures and that sort of thing. But uh, it, it, you definitely, if you think of it as... Uh, you're providing a service to your customers. What's the best possible service um, it, you could provide? And they yeah, go from there. You teased that rant out of me, didn't you? It was you, yeah. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, w- Louis, what's the the best way for somebody to to keep up with you, to follow you, and, and see what you're up to? And um, really, the website. Like, I have the most pathetic social media, and I'm trying to get better. I'm at one point. I'm just going to have to hire someone. Um, but hypercentagemartialarts.com, uh, I do a, a weekly live stream on Facebook where I actually watch the fights live and I kind of talk out loud about what we're trying to do and sometimes even workshop and stump myself. So that's a good way for people to get a window into like the process that we use because um, there's a couple of us watching the fights. It's not just me. We all check each other's work and make sure that we didn't make mistakes or try to minimize those. Um, and then, you know, I'm on, uh, you know, I'm on Instagram as well. Um, and, uh, I have a podcast, the high percentage podcast that's pretty much everywhere. Um, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, anchor, uh, you know, everywhere. Cool. And yeah, I would urge you, I've listened to, as of today, when we're recording this, I've listened to all of the podcasts that you have out. Uh, and uh, you do, a, you do a great job. You, it, it's similar to when we were talking today about white belts, what do you need to be doing? How important is, are the takedowns? How, you know, you talk about, uh, the tempo in one of them that was really cool to, to hear about. And you, and you kind of brought that tempo one, for example, you kind of talked about things that were not jujitsu a little bit, like explaining what is tempo and I, Hey, you're doing a great job on your podcast and I definitely give it a recommendation. Thanks. Yeah, that means a lot coming from you because you've had a really successful one for a long time. And um, and I, I look at ones like yours and some other ones I like to be like, okay, like who's doing it right that um, I can kind of model off of? And you're one of them. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for at least saying that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you you definitely have a, a, a niche and it's you, you're man, it's, it's cool to catch up with you or get you on here and, and have you kind of explain who you are and what you're doing because you're definitely providing a service. Like we talk about that with a gym owner, provide a, you know, a service, you know, that, that type of thing. And think of it as that, um, great resource for, for competitors and coaches alike. Can I mention something that's coming up? Yeah. Yeah. What's happening. Okay. So, um, I am, uh, partnering with gold BJJ and they're, um, a BJJ apparel company, they sell, you know, geese, rash guards, duffel bags, a, a big range of products. But they're launching an online platform in uh, July. I think like July 1st is their launch date. And basically, um, it'll be on their site. It's a monthly subscription, just like Netflix or, or Amazon Prime or something like that. Um, and you get access to like a suite of courses. Um, that teach various aspects of jiu-jitsu. And what's cool about these courses is, um, one, it's many different instructors, so you get kind of different flavors and different approaches as opposed to like an online platform where it's like one or two all the time. Um, different approaches to jiu-jitsu. Um, two, they have some like really good names, like Dean Lister is going to be on the platform. He's teaching an entire course on leg locks. And as opposed to like a DVD where it's just like a three-hour giant file, um, these are broken up into like five or 10 minute, um, videos. So it's a little bit more digestible and you could like watch it before class and then come back. 
And one of the courses that we're going to launch with is a course that I'm offering, which is um, uh, Game Theory for Beginners in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And we're going to talk about a lot of what me and you talked about today, but I'm going to try to package it in a more focused, like, um, directive way, which is, you know, kind of like those four steps that I talked to you about earlier in the podcast about, okay, like, here's a really easy framework to approach game theory and how to use game theory to um, to hack jujitsu as best you can. Yeah, man, that sounds great. Um, look, man, that's going to be really cool. I'm glad you're you're teamed up with them and and uh, like we're saying, great service you're providing yet <laughs> again. And you put yourself in that situation where you have like some knowledge about jujitsu that that you know, like you think about all the great coaches out there. A lot of them have no idea how important certain aspects of jiu-jitsu are when they when their students go compete they just know hey, you gotta learn how to do this gotta learn how to do that but some things are more important than others and uh and to just get on that page like you could literally like from the things you've said today you could go compete tomorrow and not have not have trained in the meantime and do better because you you have some new knowledge not technical not like technique wise but new knowledge of how the game works and you could go perform better tomorrow than you than you would have to, uh, earlier today, and I, I think that that's a, that's an impressive thing that you're able to do is to type something, to write something, or say something, and have somebody perform better at jujitsu. Uh, that's why getting people like you on the show is always good. Awesome, I I really appreciate about that, and and right back at you. You know, um, I think the metaphor you use a lot of the brick is a really powerful one because. Um, we're overwhelmed with options when we start training, um, and and it only gets worse, you know, because there's always more options. And <laughs> when you talk to people that have been training a while, they'll they'll start talking about when they got to a point where they eliminated techniques from their library. Um, and with your podcast, like you use the brick analogy, which is like, hey, you know, there's a lot of weapons on the shelf, but maybe right now, how about you just grab that big brick and just beat someone over the head with it? And like strategically, I think that's a cool analogy, which is, you know, narrow your skill set, become an expert at a, at a smaller number of things, and then like pursue your game plan instead of trying to like focus 5% in 10 different places, you know, focused 100% on, on one place. And, um, and I think that pays dividends. Yeah. And that's where you come in is, is where should I focus my energy now uh, and help give you some direction? Yeah. Man, this has been great. Any any final thoughts or uh, uh, words you have for the audience? Man, not really. Uh, com. Also, this is just a s- random side note, but um, I did write a book about martial arts about something completely unrelated um, called uh, The True Believers, and that's available on Amazon. So if you read some of the stuff that I've uh, written and you know maybe you like my writing style, it's a true story about uh, a martial arts cult that was in Monterey, California, like an old school Japanese jiu-jitsu uh, martial art that like blossomed into like kind of a religious cult, and um, I was actually a part of it. That's a whole nother life that I lived, <laughs> but um, you know it's it's on Amazon. It's called The True Believers. You can check that out. Yeah, and that was so. <laughs> to ask a follow up on that, uh, how long did you do that for? And and kind of what was did you did you get anything positive out of this, or was it all pretty? Oh yeah, no, I didn't. I uh, there was a lot of positives about it. That's what's tricky about cults is that they're not all bad all the time. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have any members. Um, yeah, I did that for uh, seven years, maybe a little bit more. Um, I got um, uh, black belts in three Japanese martial arts, um, and you know, I was an instructor at their headquarters in uh, Monterey. Um, you know, I taught classes, um, and I was kind of all in, but I was also much younger. And, you know, I, I just I really liked martial arts and I kind of got too caught up in the fantasy and, and kind of some hero worship of, of you know, people in charge um, and, you know, discovering Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and Gracie jiu-jitsu especially is what helped me get out of that. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm so, you know, grateful to the BJJ community for helping that helping me with that in my life. And I feel like I owe everything back, you know, so as much as I can contribute now, um, I got a debt to pay off, I suppose. Yeah, Louis, I'll put a link to the, uh, the book there in the show notes and, and people who just, if they're interested in that, that's something they could, can learn about. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think with, the, I don't know, maybe the current state of, of martial arts in the world today, that those sort of things are, 
less than they used to be? Would you? Yeah, I think they are because, um, you know, it's just harder to hide behind bullshit. There's, you know, you look at channels like Fake Black Belts or McDojo Life and like they're dedicated to exposing those people now. Um, they weren't around when I was training. Uh, but also like there's there's sort of a rubber band effect where you see, you know, some people complaining about some of the, you know, the organizations in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and saying like, ah, eh, it's a little cultish, it's getting a little weird. So that's something that we always need to safeguard against about the excesses of, of hero worship. And, um, you know, there's definitely a power relationship in jujitsu. We talked about that earlier and it can be exploited. So it's up to us to always be calling it out so that we keep jujitsu healthy and, and, uh, a positive thing for everybody. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting, uh, like I said, you have a unique, uh, background with looking at data and bring that in and you have a, a probably a fairly unique background with dealing with a, a martial arts cult that I wouldn't have even thought about that you know is this jujitsu thing kind of a cult you know like are they you know are they hazing their students when they get belts it's kind of cult like <laughs> like how do we uh, address this situation uh, one thing I always say with with students at other schools if try to not think of them as any different than the the friends you have at your school like most of the students could be just swapped out and they're the, like they're fun people to be around so even if the, the the school across town or whatever they all seem like jerks and the instructors mean and, and these crazy things are going on in reality you're looking at just a couple of people that represent the gym and most of the students mm-hmm. you probably roll with and have a good time just like anywhere else i mean that you know if you travel and, and train you, you know, like the people are fun like that's what that's what's great about like traveling and doing jiu-jitsu or going you know to open mat somewhere. It's people are here to have a good time and, and get some training in. And you know if you're hearing negative things about a school, even if they're true, it's, it's about a small amount of the people typically. Unless we're developing a whole cult of people, and that might be a little different. But <laughs> I don't know much about cults, so can't really speak about that. Well, that's one thing great about BJJ is that we're inherently an open community, which is like. We always are talking to each other, uh, you know, on the internet or you know at different gyms and stuff, and that that keeps like the waters from getting stagnant. As opposed to like what I was involved in, which is we were very insulated. Like we only talked to each other. We didn't want to be friends with people that didn't train, um, and you know we kept ourselves in the echo chamber, and and that you know contributed to a lot of our sort of delusion, and and you know people were quitting their jobs and, and just focusing on training and paying you know tens of thousands, paid tens of thousands of dollars over over the years, um, you know to my teacher and, and that whole machine, which might not have happened in BJJ because I would have had kind of people across town that maybe I could have compared myself to. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Louis, thank you so much for hopping on here with me. I look forward to uh, reading your stuff and and keeping up with your podcast there as you go, and I urge everybody else to go do the same. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. I think that was great. I want to thank Louis. He jumped right on this. I I sent him a message, and he he was real excited to do this. And and, uh, it's always great to have somebody who's professional to work with and uh, and to bring on for an interview and, and and Lewis with all of those things and and uh, look forward to, to seeing what he produces in the future and uh, I'm really just I'm glad he's he's a member of the Jiu-Jitsu community because he's has a different kind of a set of tools that he uses to look at uh, Jiu-Jitsu and, and stats and it's really cool to see and if you think this is an interview that a a friend of yours would benefit from send it their way you know tell them about episode three hundred and four. Uh, with Louis Martin and, uh, and and share that with them. And then, obviously, uh, more detailed stuff is on his website. And there'll be a link to that in the show notes. Go check that out. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of good information for you guys out there. Yeah, speaking of websites, uh, stumble across one, ATBK, Attack the Back. And I an article to check out. It's on Attack the Back, and it's five things no one talks about when you start jujitsu. Um, some of these things they might actually talk about if they want, if they listen to your audiobook your first year in BJJ. But anyway, here's five things you might not hear about when you start, but they're important. And number one is in the beginning, it's very difficult. And uh, if you're doing jujitsu and you have some experience in judo or you wrestled in high school, this wouldn't be a big shock to you. But man, if you haven't participated in this type of activity, you may be surprised at the difficulty of grappling you want to talk about exhausted most people have a difficult time making it through the warm-ups when they first start jiu-jitsu so 
Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it takes a while to get easier. Uh, and I like one thing that he says in this article is that because nobody talks about it, sometimes when you're new, you think it's going to always be like that. And a lot of people actually quit before they get through that phase. Eventually, you'll make it through the warm ups, you'll make it through the drill, you'll make it through the whole class. And eventually, some of the classes will seem kind of easy, but a lot of people will quit before they get there. So I do think that that's an important thing for us to talk about with new people. Yeah, definitely, Joe. Stick with it. It will get better. Um, the one that kept me from that kept me training jujitsu uh, was number two. You'll feel very helpless. And I remember first starting, and you know, I was just getting dominated. Just getting, you know, people were submitting me with whatever they wanted. Uh, you know, I was on the ground. I couldn't move. Uh, you know, I felt like I was in a coffin or a uh, straight jacket. Um, you know, I was just getting dominated so bad. I was so helpless. But for me, that's what kept me doing this sport. I was like, man, if uh, somebody can make me feel like this, if somebody can control all my limbs, you know, my hips, my waist, everything that way, I want to be able to do that to other people. And I was like, if I keep doing it sometime in the in the future, I will be you know, the person who can make somebody else feel helpless. So uh, even, you know, that was one thing that uh, I think really kept me going. Uh, but number two was you'll feel very, very, very helpless. Gary, does that does that reveal a darker side of you? <laughs> that that, you, that you, you, hung in, you hung with this just so that you could make people feel helpless one day? <laughs> you know, I, I guess just like I just remember just feeling so helpless that I was like, these guys are so good. They can control everything they want. And I wanted to be able to, not that I wanted to hurt people, but I wanted to be good enough that I could make other people feel that way. You know, I just remember I was like, man, this guy is so talented. I, I can't even move. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, our our uh, reasons for staying often change. And, and if you get Gary, somebody who he could easily control, you know, there's a couple of guys in this town where, you know, Gary just does, you know, he's just great against them. It's just kind of weird, but there's, there's two or three, uh, that he could beat up on pretty good. And he, de- he usually is really nice to them and helpful to them. And, uh, you know, I would say that, that, that Gary <laughs> person has changed, you know, like if he gets a new person, he's super helpful. And, and, you know, like that's what, you know, he rolls with my wife quite a bit and always helpful to her. And I, you know, I couldn't imagine him like pinning her in side control for 45 minutes and like, and, or whatever, you know, like he, that's not the type of a thing that Gary does. <laughs> so I'd say like that, that new goal that you had as a, like maybe a mid white belt has definitely changed. And, uh, and, and that's not what, uh, keeps you on the mats. Oh, you know, I don't really know if it has changed. You know, I just love, you know, being able to control like that, but I don't roll like that. You know, especially if I'm just training, I'm not uh, I'm not just going to grab somebody and just roll like that because to me, that's no fun. I like to uh, I like sweeps. I like, you know, transitions. I like scrambles. uh, But, uh, uh, you know, I I do love to be able to have that technique that you can hold somebody like that. But for me, you know, if I was rolling with Becky there and and held her in side control for 45 minutes, it's going to be no fun for either of us. And as you guys know. I roll to have fun. Uh, you know, I know you were talking about that earlier, Byron. You do jujitsu because you want to have fun. Um, and that's what it's all about to me. Yeah. Uh, going down the list here, he talks about uh, you might get hurt. <laughs> and and that's any physical activity, you might get hurt. And that's just something that, you know, Gary and I might be working and, and I post out and my elbow kind of buckles and I hurt my arm. Like those kind of freak things definitely happen. Uh, to me... Um, it's not really a thing that you should be, you shouldn't be getting injured from submissions when you're new. And so a lot of times we'll pair people up with new people with experienced people. And they're like, man, I got to go against this, this blue belt. I'm brand new. The blue belt's going to protect you because <laughs> we have a whole bunch of white belts who want to see if their arm bar works and you're going to be a great candidate for that. But we need to, to get you to understand a little bit more about jujitsu and to be able to protect yourself. And so the blue belt could arm bar you anytime, but we want to, uh, to put you up with somebody who doesn't care if they tap you out or not. You know, it's not a big deal to tap out a new person. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pair them up. And it may seem, I usually explain it to them, like, hey, this guy's, you know, he's really good. He's, he's going to make sure that you have a good experience. He's not here to beat you up. And eventually, you're going to be, you know, after a little bit of time goes, let's stop. And you end up rolling with other white belts. And just remember that your safety is very important. And, you know, you shouldn't be 
trying to risk injury to escape a, a technique when you're training, especially when you're brand new. Like, like you don't know kind of where your boundaries are as far as when things get injured. So, so be careful. Um, you know, bumps and bruises that those all happen, you know, and, and, and things like that. But, you know, to be arm barred and injured, you know, in your first month is, is a little bit your fault, but it's a lot of the, the environment's fault is like, I can't imagine, the, I can't think of the last time I, I arm barred a new person or submit, submitted somebody who's new and, and caused injury from that. Like if, if I want to arm bar you and we're doing this and you're not tapping, I stop and say, hey, you really shouldn't arm bar? Yeah. Okay. Do, are you able to, to wiggle or get out of this? Not really. Okay. This is a good time. Like just, I'm not going to injure somebody because the submission, uh, you know, if I feel like I'm, I'm getting it and I'm confident with that, I'll stop. And, and sometimes if they're new, I'll ask them. And sometimes if they're experienced, I'll say, what are you doing? Like, why are you like, uh, how are you getting out of this? How is this not working? If I think that's the case, but, um, none of us should be injuring our training partners because they're not tapping or not tapping fast enough. This is, um, it's, it's that catch and release thing. Um, you need to train safely and you need to be the type of person who, if, if you feel like your training partner let up a little bit just for your safety and you bust out of it at 110 miles an hour, don't be that way either. Your, your training partner is trying to, trying to be safe with you. And uh, if you take advantage of that, that might go away. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I don't know if we always do a real good job of explaining why we put the newer students with upper belts. I, I think some newer students go home class after class thinking, God, he just keeps putting me with blue belts and purple belts. I keep getting whooped. Uh, man, I just want to roll with some white belts where I have a chance. The reality is if you're in your first month or two at jiu-jitsu, uh, three or four stripe white belts – still going to beat you up just like the blue and purple belts, only you have a much higher uh, chance of getting hurt and having a bad experience. So that was a great explanation, Byron. But th- there's definitely more to the article. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's on attacktheback.com and, and check it out. We only covered three of the five things. <laughs> Leave you uh, a little bit more to be desired, maybe. Guys, I'm excited. It's coming up. It's right around the corner, June 14, 15, and 16. We have the BJJ Brick event in Wichita, Kansas, and we would like you to be there. You know, we're excited to have a lot of our listeners kind of come together for this event and and get some mat time with us. Uh, There are limited spots available. Contact Jake Jake Fox. You can go to Fox Fitness BJJ and uh dot com and, and find the link there i'll put a there's a picture on our uh, show notes or on the website there and you could you could see the information on that and click that and go to the to the link it brings you to it as well man i'm excited to to kind of get some some good times with our uh, some of our audience who do we have this year at the bjj break event we have gina franson and samir chantre so uh looking forward to some great uh instruction um Byron, are these going to be, one's going to be Gi, one's going to be Noki? Yeah, so Gina will be Gi. So Gina and, and Samir will be on Saturday, and uh, Gina will be Gi, and Samir will be Noki. Uh, that Friday night beforehand uh, is, is just get together, roll in, having a good time, and, and get, get kind of get the weekend started off right. And then Sunday, uh, the BJJ Brick crew will be showing you uh, some stuff that uh, we've been working hard on. And uh, well, that sounded bad. We've been working <laughs> <laughs> working our best to present in, in a way that uh, that you're going to learn a lot and be able to retain it and, and make some, some changes to your game that are going to make some significant differences. And uh, really excited about that. And there's going to be some surprises uh, and some uh, some updates to the podcast as well. And that's going to be a, and, kind of a once in a lifetime event. So, Joe, we got that to look forward to. Byron hasn't told us about that. I have not told you guys about any surprises. Yeah, I don't know if I like nope. surprises. <laughs> hey, I bet I know what's going to happen, Joe. You and I you, are going to get. You found fired. our replacement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we found our replacement. So, uh, <laughs> me and Joe, we're going to come up with the BJJ Brick Number One podcast. There you go, or or yep. the Better Brick podcast. Yeah. And if somebody yeah. came out with that, this we'd have to shut this down immediately. <laughs> but uh, gonna, yeah, the, the Joe, retirement ceremony for Joe and Gary was going to be Sunday on the sixteenth. <laughs> yeah. Joe, we will come up with the B or the BJJ BJJ Cinderblock podcast. Cinderblocks are stronger than bricks, Byron. I don't know. They're bigger. Well, they're bit. They're bigger. I don't know if they're, they're stronger. I, I don't know. If well, they're... we'll make them stronger because we're going to reinforce it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We got the foundation, the base. No base, no case. There you go. Yep. 
But so, yeah, so definitely what, don't miss it. June fourteenth through June sixteenth, Wichita, Kansas, Fox Fitness. And one thing we won't be doing at the event is playing favorites. Everybody that comes will be treated the same. Uh, Byron's going to make sure he's got a chance to roll with everybody and meet everybody, and um, so we're looking forward to that. Some people find that within their own gym, there seems to be some playing of favorites by their coach. We had a question that was emailed in. My instructor plays favorites with some of the students. How can I make things more fair? What do you think about that, Gary? You know, uh, a lot of instructors like chocolate. Have you thought about bringing uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, uh, (laughs) Snickers? I think that would make your instructor like you. That might work. Now, I wonder in this particular case, if part of what he's getting at is, you know, the instructor oftentimes picks just a couple of the same students over and over to uh, use as a training partner when he's demoing moves. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you would think of as a student when you say my instructor plays favorites. But yeah. uh, if, if, it, if it's kind of that, um, just in an answer to the question that's in, so sometimes it might be on our end. You know, if, if the instructor's not picking you, maybe there's a, a reason. I don't know. Um, on that I wish one, I had Joe, more information. On, on that one, it's not always the, a great thing to be the, the training, the demonstration dummy. You know, <laughs> sometimes that person gets absolutely annihilated for much longer than needed as they explain how this pressure is working and why his face is making this, this expression and, and all these things are happening. Uh, that's kind of miserable sometimes. <laughs> yeah. but, I will tell you, I was uh, Byron's uh, dummy for Byron's triangle seminar. So I got put in triangles for, you know, a couple hours, you know, one after another. And while Byron's explaining how the pressure works and I'm stuck in there. And uh, I, I tell you, that was a brutal couple hours right there. So uh, and there's, I, always, I can, there's I always that one guy it. that's like, hey, can we see that one more time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, shut up, please, please. <laughs> Kind of um, in super slow mo. Yeah, you know, I was wondering though. You know, my instructor plays favorites are some of the students. I, I was thinking like uh, um, he's talking about uh, uh, you know promotions. Um, you know, we hear that a lot. Uh, you know, somebody thinks, "Hey, I, I'm better than this guy," um, and he got a promotion. So I'm wondering if uh, if that's you know part of the question there too. And uh, you know. Uh, sometimes you, you may be able to tap out a guy who got promoted, but do you, is your technique really better? Are you muscling through stuff? Um, See, I don't even uh, know if that's a, if that's a favorite because it, it, it may feel good to get that new belt, but man, it feels bad to get it if it's a little bit early. <laughs> um, you know what I mean by that? But I don't know. I mean, I don't think anybody ever thinks they're ready for the belt. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's your, I think, I mean, that's the one thing I hear from everybody. You know, I've never heard anybody like, oh, yeah, I deserve this belt. You know, everybody's like, man, I don't think I'm ready. And now I got a, a mark on, you know, everybody's going to be attacking me. But, you know, we've talked about this numerous times. If your instructor gives you the belt, you know, promotes you to that belt, you're deserving of it. You know, don't question it. It's, uh, uh, that your instructor sees something. You, you've shown that you're ready for it. Or and, if your uh, instructor has you wait a little bit, they might see something that they uh, expect you to do a little bit better. Even if you're maybe yeah. more athletic or younger than this guy that he just promoted and you could do things but like, hey, I want this guy to really um, perform you know, at this level. When he, Your belt is an individualized thing. You know, We kind of do this in groups. as like, I'm with the blue belts now or I'm with the purple belts now. But really, you're your blue belt version of you. And, and, and that moves along as you, as you go, but your instructor has like a, a gauge of what you're capable of. And he wants you to hit that blue belt you before they, you get that belt. And that might be something that's significantly different than, uh, the blue belt who has wrestled for a long time and refuses to, to play any bottom position. He might push him, you know, keep waiting, keep waiting. Like, I want you to learn how to do a sweep first or, you know, do how to, uh, do an armbar from your back, you know, uh, that sort of thing, even though he's you know, performing well with most blue belts, just in rolling situations. I look at this like my my instructor plays favorites. It that sometimes it just feels that way. Sometimes it is that way. I'm sure I have I have students who I roll with a lot more than other students because they're enjoyable to roll with more than others or something like that. Like not on purpose. Like sometimes you just your personality might gravitate towards somebody else. Another thing would be if if you're new and and new could be even like you know nine months. Like I've known people I've trained with, you know, for years, you know, I've known Gary since 2002. So if you come in and you work with us for a few months, like 
you're still coming into a situation where two people know each other very well, and then the third person is fairly new to that, and it's and it might feel like eh, Byron really plays favors with Gary all the time. No, I've just known him forever. I, I, I like I just mesh with the guy differently than than you. And as you spend more time, you're going to be incorporated into the, to the group, of course. But we, like I think of it with the fire station when when we get sent out to a different fire station that's not ours, like those people. They're usually all nice and friendly, like a, like a jiu-jitsu gym, but they all know each other really well. They work and sleep and eat, you know, all these things um, as a team and, and, and together, and you're coming in, and I don't know if they've known each other for 20 years or if they're all a bunch of uh, new people or whatever, but um, you're kind of coming into a group where people might have really long and strong relationships, and they might have traveled together and, you know, experienced some failures or hardships together, and, uh, and it's just just give it time, you know, it, uh, be, be yourself, be, try to have fun on the mats and, and, uh, and your instructor or other students will, uh, will warm up to you. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, something else here, you got to keep in mind that your instructor is trying to build a team. And so he's going to invest in the students. And then this may not be the case with the person that emailed this. And that's why I, I try to be careful when I say these things, but, um, an instructor is more likely to invest time in a student that's holding up their end of the bargain. I mean, they expect you to pay your dues, but on top of that, there's kind of an expectation that you come to at least two classes a week, that you get there early enough to be ready for the start of warmups, participate in the whole class, you know, c- catch your roles afterwards, put out some effort, uh, ask some intelligent questions. And the students that do that well, and they're obviously investing in their jujitsu journey, are probably going to be the students that the instructor is also going to invest more time into. So uh, that might be something you want to think about as well. Yeah, good good point, Joe. And I, I think about just Fox Fitness. Jake likes some of the students who are kind of ornery sometimes, you know, who who uh, give them a hard time. And uh, you might yeah, Jake see, likes that. Yeah, it's just you know he's there all day at the gym. And when somebody comes in and and is a bit ornery or or uh, you know there there to kind of ruffle his feathers, he I think he kind of enjoys that. <laughs> so uh, you know, as a new person, that might be kind of hard to come in your first week and you're you're teasing about something. You know, his shorts are too short or something that happens. Jake wears some short shorts sometimes, <laughs> 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 but uh, you know he just he might not take that the same way as if he's known you for a little you know a couple of months or something like that, and then you and you kind of kind of razz him a little bit, but. I don't know. Hang with it, and uh, it's probably not being done on purpose. It's just uh, people have different relationships with other people, and uh, just work on that that quality relationship with your coach. Or, you know, you learn a lot from other students as well. You might have a stronger bond with with somebody else, kind of in your same shoes, and you can might like, go up together uh, with the journey that you guys are on. You know, I'm glad we went over that question because, you know, I've always said the same thing to my family, you know, about the podcast. You know, it's like, hey, the leader of our podcast, the owner of it there plays favorites with uh, <laughs> with the other employee. And, uh, you know, I feel like I'm left out all the time. So uh, that gave me some good advice. Thank you, guys. Gary, you just got to put out a little more effort. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, want to give a quick shout out to a couple of our Patreon supporters, Paul, Christopher, and Michael. Thank you guys for the support on Patreon, uh, w- which you do if you want to support us. You could, I mean, we have audiobooks is is one way. Um, Patreon's the other main way that we have. Uh, there's a link in the show notes uh, to our Patreon site. Um, you could pledge a dollar, three dollars, whatever you you think is uh, a good number for us, or and that you could afford. If you're not able to at this time financially. Uh, do something like this hey listen enjoy the podcast it's a free thing but if you're able to kind of send us some support and help us out we really appreciate that and we'll mail you out a five inch BGJ brick key patch and a sticker and um, you're invited to join a private Facebook group where we kind of discuss some uh, behind the scenes activities if you want to do that uh, and, and you're a Patreon supporter send me an email at bjjbrick at gmail.com with a link to your Facebook profile and uh, I'll get you added into our, our private Facebook group be a lot of fun there, guys. We'll yeah, see and Gary. Pri- <laughs> yep, that private Facebook page has gotten a little more active lately. It's great to see and uh, pop on there, ask us some questions, make fun of fire, and whatever you want to do, it's your page. Yeah, had a good time this week. Learned a lot from uh, our, our, our new uh, friend, Louie, and uh, look forward to, to seeing what he does in the future. So until then, stay sweaty, my friends. 
And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, get better, guys. We'll see you on the mats. We'll see you on the mats Father's Day weekend. Roger that. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs>